call and response. The Canadian shield calls to the fault in Temiskaming Lake. The shield shelters more than half the land. The fault, tectonic, replies with the Ottawa River, whose waters run east and spread at the place of two mountains, becoming lake. In this way, the lake is of lake. Song of Song, Du Montagne out of Temiskaming. The lake there, at the two mountains, calls to the trees near and around, riparian trees on rocky shores, and the terrestrials within two miles of the shore. Perpetual loop. One verse, then the other. Connecting trees to the sand, the orthic, melanic, brunisol soil, tree canopies, consolations of climate. The way birds in the morning define the new day, call sunrise from night. The trees call to each other their own names, sugar maple, hickory, eastern white pine. Black willow chants the alphabets of green ash. Yellow birch calls to red maple, choke cherry to beech. They bear multiple names, formal, scientific, common French, and the names that are Mohawk, and no names at all. Their calls travel through air, water, through earth, sedges and shrubs, algae and cumulus clouds, all conversing, rocks and black leeches, sturgeon, green frogs, limestone and vascular plants. How does the sky reply when silverback leaves tug at the wind, blocking the passage to sea? Clouds ring with rain, and the lake lifts small pewter washes in rows of applause. What listens to sugar maple's clear amber flow? Rays, yellow and cold. Fine beads of drizzle hiss the filigreed ice. What answers flood cover drowning hickory knees? Clay or silt, till or clay loam, sap in the spring. Sugar maple is always and in all places attentive, alert for replies from the open terrain. The soil, fine or sandy, alluvium, measures the length of flood time in spring, speaks a name to the climate, the warmest in the whole province call and response, a dominant tree, Acer saccharum, sugar tree that humans can eat. Monastic life number two. It is interior, hidden in cochlea, behind lenses, just under the skin. It is the sound of chair legs backing away from the table, three times a day, the fragrance of beeswax, soundless prayer, morning mist, incense lifting from the censer's broad swing. Not the censer, not the convex of bells, silver etched, angels and stars, not 12 wheels of cheese or a hand held in the forge, not the hammer or horse, not white robes, hoods, tunics of wool, but the effect of it all, the bell's seduction, the geese rising from shore, not the wafer, but the wafer's weight on the tongue, light as ash. Not the man, but the way a man disappears in the habit of all. How own a lake? A child begins owning the lake, its lifting haunt in mourning, its sun-slapped birds, begins to own the rud that coats evening, sunsets hinged behind the gap to the west begins owning the islet that floats offshore, boulder pinned. She upends smaller stones, plucks innocent snails. She claims the islet's frogs and the rivets of frogs, moves the stirring lumps, owns the waves and the far shore that looses them, owns water lilies bobbing beneath the far end bridge, yards them out, lays them in layers on the rowboat's wet floor. She owns water weeds that yank at her feet, tadpoles butting, which she collects, black leeches, which she salts. And the monastery across the lake, which she cannot see, does she own it as well, 
and the reservation across the lake, completely unknown. The duck blind near the point, she claims, and lapping sounds, and darning needles switching blue and rapiers of grass, the briny pong, the smart of slime that chokes the small elbowed bay, and the lake. The lake begins owning the child, carves its winged shape into her young green stick bones, into places there where holiness will soak, and a loneliness she can't hope to shake. Monastic life number four. It resides with honeybees, rows of hives along wire fences to the west, each queen drowsing in the jellied center of a world. Bless each queen that she survives the freeze, that she recites sweet piping sounds in spring as icicles release the sun. Bless the orchard trees as they hold up their plain gray twigs. Fields of clover one day will levitate, hover in July's keening light. Bless the workers too, dull huddled in their combs, that they remember flight, uncup their double wings against leftover cold. Bless each monk who dreams of honey, pantry light, stolen to illuminate dim winter shelves. They are praying for forgiveness and for blossoms to burst April buds. How mend the years? Let him sit on the beach, my uncle, in his lawn chair that folds like a stork, aluminum and shredded blue webbing, glass of labats in his hand. Let him unreel the past on the waves, psalms, pastures and lilies, the cosmos blooming, stargazing, a blur he almost can feel, made one with what he is seeing, lake and the line between water and sky. Let him hum without tune. He spools thin lines of bliss as if fishing, hitching this place to the quiet promise of peace, geography's comforting shape, this bluish brown water, this meniscus parasol sky, moving, unmoving, unhurried as prehistorical time. Let him memorize the lake's surface. Find in what he sees there something that mends. Lake number two, drawing cowls of quiet around uncertain space, sinking through pebbles and coarse grains of sand, no sound, it spreads into grass, lies flat for seasons, timeless, hovering even at shore, a presentiment, a mirage, shape-shifting mesmer, holding the surrounding rocks in place by reverence alone. The air above claims no geography. The lake needs nothing but river's brown mouth, solitary, quiet as the dragonfly that quilts nimbus gloss, as the eel that ribbons the squelch, as unlit fish surveying beneath searest weeds, even when shirred, when breezes scoop atoms of foam, even when the world slants with rain and with wind, the lake won't complain. White noise alone, nothing the ear can locate. Even in early morning when heron spears frog, no sound rings out. <laughs>